and welcome to the Yahoo Finance World Economic Forum's Davos Agenda Panel. It is part of the forum's week of virtual meetings, bringing together global leaders to find sustainable solutions for a post-COVID world. And today we're gonna to be examining the global economy and how it may look after COVID-19 and explore new opportunities in the post-pandemic world. We wanna mention that this session is on the record. It's available online on the World Economic Forum's website, as well as on Yahoo Finance. And I'm excited to introduce to you our panelists today who are uh, leaders in their respective fields. First, we have economist and best-selling author, Dambisa Moyo. We have founder and co-CEO of Ariel Investments, John Rogers, and president of the Rockefeller Foundation, Dr. Rajiv Shah. Our thanks to you all for spending time with us to discuss this very important topic. Um, as we all know, a lot of trends that were already underway pre-pandemic have just been accelerated by the impact of the pandemic. And I think this is especially true when we look at the digital economy. So many of us now having to pivot and work from home, learn from home. There's telemedicine, delivery services. We're using technology in ways we never thought we would in our personal lives, in our work lives. Then Bisa, I'm gonna start with you. What do you think the future of work is going to look like post pandemic, especially when you consider how much our digital economy has exploded in just this past year. Well, thank you so much. I'm delighted to be able to join you and to spend some time with both Rajiv and John. Um, your question is particularly important because as you say, we were already talking about issues of automation and technological unemployment before COVID hit. Um, what has happened is many institutions, public organizations, as well as private corporations um, have been slightly backfooted um, in terms of the adaptation and the speed with which we've had to adapt to these new circumstances. Um, before COVID hit in earnest, the speculation, and there were numerous reports, in fact, one from Oxford Martin School in 2013 that had forecasted that at least 47% of jobs in the United States would be lost because of, of, of uh, automation. That number has been um, adjusted a number of times, but it is absolutely the case that digitization and automation is front and center, certainly on the boards of corporations on which I serve, but more generally as well. I, I think that the question um, is particularly uh, problematic because we aren't or we are ill-prepared um, for what that automated world might look like. I actually am in the middle of writing a paper for Harvard Business Review on how we're gonna try and manage um, not just individuals, but teams um, between people who are focused on individual work versus collaborative work and trying to find that right balance in order to make sure that companies can defend their culture, but maintain operations and make sure that employees remain engaged um, and motivated. John, I'm going to bounce off that with you. Uh, would you agree with Jambisa that we are ill-prepared for sort of the next chapter or the next leg of this digital economy? Uh, you know, I think, you know, America has a way to always adapt. And we seemingly, you know, as Warren Buffett always talks about, you know, last century, we got through the Great Depression. We got through the pandemic. We got through two world wars, et cetera. And so we at Ariel are always thinking long term. And I do think that, you know, the boards that I'm on, everyone has said this has really been helpful in actually in some ways, it's been a horrific, obviously heartbreaking time. But when it comes to the digital transformation, we've been able to telescope five years into one year. And I think it's helping us to get actually better prepared for this new world that we're all going to be living in. And uh, so I'm quite optimistic. We're gonna come out of this stronger than ever even after all the heartbreak and, and death. And I think you're right. I mean, it's all happening at lightning speed and it's out of necessity that it's all happening. But Rajiv, how do we do that? How do we emerge from this um, in the next chapter of this digital economy and, and do it in an equitable way? I mean, we know that the virus has disproportionately affected uh, different pockets of the economy, uh, the black community, the impoverished being hospitalized and, and dying from the virus at a much higher rate than the rest of, of the population. So how do we move forward with the future of work and the digital economy in, in a more inclusive way? Well, it's it's great to be with you and thank you. And, and I agree with both John and Dembisa in, in uh, pointing out that this is accelerating our transition to a new world. The question is, what is that new world going to look like? The reality, as you've just mentioned, is COVID-19 has been the largest driver of inequity we've seen since World War II. 
And in fact, the world's 2,200 billionaires have gained about $2 trillion of asset value, while at least in the United States, 60% of American households have had to significantly fall behind, choose between feeding their families and paying for their prescription drugs and trying to stay safe while being forced into kind of essential work that has also created real risks. And the brunt of that has been most severe in minority communities where one in 1,000 African Americans have died from COVID and where the hospitalization rate is three to five times higher. And you know, it's easy to think that we're just gonna kind of get beyond COVID and that divergence will cease to occur. But the reality is probably the opposite. The reality is you know, we're, we're likely to see much of the richer industrial world get access to vaccines maybe two or three years sooner than herd immunity is achieved through vaccination and inoculation in much of the developing and emerging world. And the result of that will be big reservoirs of viral replication that continue for, for the next several years in a population of people that could be as high as four or five billion people. So the reality is you're, I think you're gonna see this great divergence in economic fortunes uh, really have even more bite over the course of the next three to five years. And that's really why strong coordinated action to ensure that there's a just and equitable recovery is necessary right now. That starts with massive investments in making sure that everyone has access to the tools to overcome the virus, which is just not happening at the scale it needs to. And it extends to making sure that the global economic recovery is jobs rich and focused in particular on those that are otherwise left behind. Speaking of working together here, we have got world governments, um, central banks around the world, basically throwing everything they've got at the pandemic. Um, Dambisa, might this crisis perhaps force innovation in terms of the fiscal tools, the monetary tools that our world governments and central banks can use going forward? Well, I, again, I think this is something that was already um, happening. It's been catalyzed. I mean, I think the question that everyone is sort of focused on is what is the role of cryptocurrencies in this space? And whether you love them or hate them, um, you know, someone said to me recently, it's essentially Bitcoin bugs are like gold bugs of yesteryear. Um, and so, you know, to the extent that the Chinese government in particular are, are focused not only on the question of what does a reserve currency look in a world that might be more balkanized um, and much more in a more deglobalized um, um, institutional organization, uh, sort of a um, world. Um, we also have the question about whether the Chinese are going to support a much more um, crypto um, type of, uh, of uh, currency, which could materially affect fiat currencies such as the dollar, which we've seen weaken. Um, somewhat in, you know, in, in trading in the uh, last several months. Um, and so I do think we have to be open-minded about what this might mean. John, what I, I, it's interesting that Dambisa brings up cryptocurrencies. We've seen a tremendous rise in, in Bitcoin and other related cryptocurrencies in the past year. Now we have a new administration, not sure yet how the Biden administration is going to deal with regulation in that industry. But how do you see cryptocurrencies sort of, sort of being a part of the, of the narrative? Uh, post this pandemic? I really do believe that um, this is going to end up being one of the greatest bubbles of all time. Um, you know, Bitcoin doesn't really do anything. It, it's, you know, uh, it, it's something that I think has just been sort of morphed into this giant, giant, giant bubble and it's going to collapse. You know, I mentioned Warren Buffett earlier. You know, he has been extraordinarily critical of this and so is his partner, Charlie Munger. Um, of course, they're also not big, big believers in investing in gold, uh, things that really do not produce any tangible benefit to society or make any difference. And, you know, I do believe over time you're going to see this, people are going to look back in history and say, what were we thinking? What were we doing when it came to Bitcoin? But does it have a place in our society, maybe as, a, as another asset class, as perhaps a hedge, John? It could be for a while, I, I guess. These things can take on a life of their own and you never ever know uh, when bubbles are gonna pop. They can often last much longer than anyone can anticipate. I know my good friend, Bill Miller, believes you know, deeply in these and I know there's another side to this argument and so I respect the other, mm -hmm. other, other side. But I just don't see this in the long run. I just cannot see 20 years from now, 30 years from now, this being an asset class that America and the world uh, works with.
Okay, we'll have to come back in a couple of decades and, and check in on that, John. But Raj, I, I want to uh, get back to you and, and the impact the virus is going to have on our global health care system. I mean, do you think this, that virus screenings will just become a regular part of our lives and very much the same way security measures became a part of all of our lives post 9-11? I, I do. You know, you, you're going to have to see a much bigger and more ubiquitous uh, set of options for testing uh, that takes place all over the world and persists for many years. I think you're going to need uh, systems like uh, like COVID Pass and other things that we at Rockefeller have helped create so that people can document, uh, you know, whether they've been inoculated and whether they represent a cross-border threat when traveling. Uh, I think you're going to need much, much bigger investments in you know, the 50 to 60 countries that right now are struggling mightily to get reasonable access to the vaccine, both uh, because supply is too limited right now for the most effective vaccines and because of complex indemnification issues that are holding back uh, many middle income countries from being able to launch large scale vaccination campaigns. And I would just point out one thing. This is not likely to be over quickly. Uh, I think, you know, we're going to be wearing masks for a couple of years is my guess. And I'd go beyond that and suggest that if we allow a large viral replication reservoir to exist in the, anywhere on earth, and it'll likely be in places that are more resource poor, that's gonna present huge risk to the rest of the planet because you know, some of these viruses will mutate. They will, those mutations will affect the binding site of the antibodies that currently are working and are our pathway out and they will invalidate the validity of, of current vaccines and monoclonal antibodies. And we've started to see in the South African variant some public data being published that indicates that's a very, very real risk and it's taking place now. So in the long history of you know, viral uh, virology, this is, this is sort of in the middle of the game, not at the end of the game. And, and we have to be conscientious of that and take some bolder actions today as a globe to protect our global economy. Okay, so if, if President Biden is listening, what, what are some of the bold actions he should be taking in the first 100 days? Well, I think he's starting to do a lot of the things right on a public health basis. The first is just massively scale up access to the vaccine, both in the United States, where we've hit maybe 20 to 25 percent of our previously stated vaccination targets, and just as importantly, on a global basis. You know, in America, we just committed $4 billion to COVAX, and the Biden team just rejoined this global uh, partnership to vaccinate everybody. But it's hugely under-resourced. And when you think of the trillions of dollars of fiscal support we've had to put into the US economy to deal with the consequence of COVID, you know, if we were spending tens of billions of dollars to vaccinate everyone on the planet and every other industrial nation was doing its part mm -hmm. to help make this an urgent global action, uh, that would be a great place to start. I think genomic surveillance, uh, where there's real-time sharing of genetic sequencing data so that everyone can see are the genetic sequences changing the virus enough to invalidate some of the tools we're all relying on. Though these are small investments, a few hundred million dollars can go a long way, but they protect the whole planet from, from the risk of losing, you know, another 20, 30 billion, uh, trillion dollars of economic value from a round two of COVID-21 or COVID-23. I want to get back to how this is all going to impact um, corporations globally. Uh, Dembi, so this one's for you. I mean, we've seen um, companies, especially with international supply chains, uh, have problems. There are shortages. There are bottlenecks. How will the supply chains look different post-pandemic? Are we going to see a lot of reshoring? And I have to think that's not great for job creation, since a lot of that, I would imagine, would become automated. So talk to us a little bit about the phenomenon of regional supply chains that we might see post-pandemic. So uh, I think that this is uh, at the center of the, the, the sort of uh, important and urgent decision-making that companies are going to have to make. Um, full disclosure, I'm on the board of 3M. We're making the N95 masks. I believe we're the market leader. Um, we've had enormous, and it's been very public, enormous challenges um, in terms of uh, distribution and really been at the core face of these geopolitical questions that you're touching on. Um, we produce a lot of these masks in China. The Chinese government 
on the back of Wuhan, decided to, to curb supply. And of course, the United States um, under President Trump had a Defense Protection Act imposed. So fundamentally, supply chains, and you know, I'm just giving you examples right now on supply chains to move, to produce and move goods. But of course, you know, when a much more deglobalized world, all these things come into question. Our ability to trade across borders, our ability to, to support the carry trade, borrowing low interest rates in London and New York and investing in risk-adjusted, higher-yielding environments like Brazil or South Africa becomes highly complicated in a world where there might be more capital controls. Movement of people becomes much more challenged. And we know about immigration becoming such a hotbed, um, you know, third rail issue in many of the developed um, developed nations. Um, and of course, um, as you think about regionalization and this question, um, we, you know, it throws up issues of cooper global cooperation. It's sort of a much more uh, every nation for itself. Hopefully, as Rajiv just um, intimated, I hope there's much more motivation and catalyzing a uh, catalyzation towards more uh, cooperation. But we are already seeing even standards being challenged in the interest of uh, questions of the splinter net with the Chinese with a new um, or, or really investing in, uh, in intellectual uh, protocols that could rival the West on a technology basis. So it's a, it's in terms of corporations and making those decisions, um, we have to figure out where to allocate capital and resources in terms of human capital um, in a way that we can keep functioning, keep growing, defend our cultures, but at the same time, um, ensure that the operations continue. That's extremely challenged, um, even just in terms of how we think about things. We've spent 30 years plus in a globalized world where these issues were, were sort of more um, risk mitigated. And now they're incredibly live um, um, and, and you know, as Rajiv was saying, the issues around even something like distribution of a vaccine, never mind the logistics of it, just the, the sort of um, uh, ethical and moral questions. Do you give a Zambian who's 95 the vaccine between a, before a 50-year-old German? I mean, these are questions where everybody's going to be um, sort of thinking about much more aggressively as, as this continues. You bring up a lot of great points, and I, I want to get John in here. Just to go back to that supply chain regionalization issue, John, I would imagine this is going to create an explosion mm -hmm. of cross-border data flows. Um, and, and if that's the case, where might the opportunities be for corporations, but also for investors? Uh, you know, what I've been able to see, you know, I've been fortunate to be on a couple of large boards that are engaged and involved with this. Uh, I've been on the McDonald's board for 18 years, and uh, a couple of years ago and joined the Nike board. And of course, their ability to source product throughout the world and their manufacturing capability has been you know, very, very important to their success. And I have to say that when we talk about the future, those companies have been doing extraordinarily well. The stocks have held up very well. Nike in particular has been very strong. So I think it gives you this, this vision that we're again, adapting to this new world remarkably quickly remarkably fast. And uh, as we you know, shift around, I think the idea is to do things intelligently and thoughtfully, but realizing this is a, a relatively short-term problem. And so you're not gonna throw the baby out with the bathwater and transform the world because we've all seen in the past, pandemics come and then pandemics end. And I think at the time, sometimes you get so swept up in the moment of now and the emotions of now, you think you need to transform everything I think these extraordinary businesses that have been built over generations kind of understand that. So there are adjustments to be made, there are things to be made, but I think at the end of the day, they're gonna be more efficient, uh, more effective, and the companies will be able to grow and be more profitable as, as, as we move into the, the next year or two or three after we get through this. You know, as we move into all of this, as we work our way out of it, we've seen how much governments around the world have had to spend to help combat uh, the economic crisis that was born from this pandemic. What do we do with all the debt? And I'd like for each of you to, to just weigh in on this. And, and Rajiv, I'll begin with you. I mean, we could continue to have the debt rise and just pass it along to our kids and there's kids, kids, and so it goes. But at some point, it's going to come home to roost. So maybe we don't worry about the debt right now while we're in the throes of things, but at some point we're going to have to. What's the best and equitable way that we can do that? Well, I, I will. I will leave the long-term challenge of dealing with that debt to the others on this panel, who, who might have more to offer on it. I, I do think your point about we are in a crisis and are going to continue to be in a global economic crisis for the next several years, especially for the bulk of 
people, the bulk of working families across the planet. And, you know, just to put it in perspective, you mentioned earlier the, the huge stimulus and monetary actions that have been taken. You know, some estimates indicate those are roughly between 20 and 30 percent of GDP in, across most OECD countries uh, with powerful central banks. In much of the emerging world, without that capacity, it's been closer to three to five percent. And, you know, that's simply not going to be sufficient. And that's why, while the 2,200 billionaires made a trillion, $2 trillion, that's why the World Bank has estimated that 435 million people have been pushed back under the poverty line. I mean, this is a rewinding of global development that, and, and global human development outcomes that is probably undoing 15 to 20 years of real human progress. So uh, managing the long-term debt issues is going to be important, but I, I would just highlight that we're still in an urgent crisis. And frankly, we need some type of global coordinated economic plan that helps to lift up much of the emerging world that has not had the capacity to make the kinds of investments other nations have made. And you know, Dambisa, we've heard Fed Chair Powell say as much, you know, we can't worry about the debt now. Uh, we just have to worry about, about the issues at hand and how we can help. But, but again, I ask you, what should the plan be for, for capping this debt or at least trying to pay it off over the next few decades? So, you know, I, I think, again, in terms of context, we've been dealing with a lot of these problems, particularly after the 2008 crisis. So although, again, the, the, this uh, COVID uh, global pandemic is accelerating a lot of these issues, um, whether it's around automation debt, et cetera, we were already dealing with this. We had low interest rate environment. We had a situation already where economic growth was low and slow. Remember, Germany, Q4 2019, 0% growth. US, um, the UK was around 1.2, 1.4. You need at least 3% growth per annum in order to double per capita incomes in a generation, which is 25 years. Many big countries, Brazil, the other uh, Australia's, uh, excuse me, the Argentina's, South Africa, Russia, we're, al we're already at one to two percent before the crisis. So this is not something that we can hitch only to this uh, to the COVID thing. But specifically around debt, um, you know, the, the, I would say in terms of emerging markets, there are conversations that are live around HIPIC, a potential HIPIC. So this is a heavily indebted poorest countries, some kind of either um, suspension or moratorium on those debts. They're re trying to restructure um, the maturities and coupons. There's a, there are very lively discussions. I've been privileged to be part of those conversations with the recognition that we're in a much more complicated world. China is now the largest lender in many in places in the emerging markets, and we need them at the table to have this conversation. So there's no quick fix. The Congressional Budget Office in the US in 2016 was already cautioning about Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and the fact that every class of debt, government, household, corporate, auto loans, student loans, was at a trillion dollars each before COVID hit. So it's a problem. Um, I take the view, and it's my last point, um, you know, really drawing on the work of Ken Rogoff and Carmen Reinhardt um, in their wonderful book called This Time is Different. They looked at 900 years of government debt to GDP ratios being over 60%. It has material consequences for growth, which ends up being at two, you know, 2% or lower. It's not enough, but we're in an emergency. So we have to solve the here and now. And I agree with Rajiv, we've got to solve the healthcare crisis. Um, and we've got to try and essentially kick the, the can down the road. And I think there's, if there's more cooperation, bringing China on board, which is the largest foreign lender to the US government, to understand that we're in this crisis, we will pay at some future date when we get growth back on track. That is the sort of conversation we need to have given the situation we're in at the moment. So John, weigh in here, if I'm hearing Dambisa correctly, this has to be a multilateral effort uh, to, to draw down our debt in the, in the decades to come. What's your take on that? Well, you know, I think at least here in America, you know, I'm a, a domestic stock picker at Ariel. That's my job here. And so I'm always thinking about the United States. And as we know, we have the ability to print money and we've had debt increasing over several generations now. You know, it's, this is not a new problem. And of course, our stock market's gone higher, our economy's grown. We've been able to have great success despite the large debt burden that we have right now. I do think what's going to happen now though, because of this extra stimulus coming through on top of all the other spend, that we're going to end up with higher inflation than people expect. I think it'll be significantly higher than what the Fed has been talking about. 
and therefore it's going to push interest rates significantly higher than are anticipated. And so I think that's going to be the cost to our society is these higher rates are going to be, of course, make homes less affordable. These growth stocks that have boomed, that have benefit from, benefited from enormous lower interest rates, uh, as you value those companies, you're going to value them differently in an economy where uh, interest rates are moving, moving higher. So I'd be very careful about the FANG stocks. I'd be very careful about the S&P 500 that's dominated by those high growth companies in this new environment. I think that'll be the cost of high inflation that will come from that will come from the enormous spend. I want to go around uh, the virtual table now with the few minutes that we have left and leave folks with uh, some optimistic thoughts. Uh, and Rajiv, I'll start with you. What are you most optimistic about as we work our way through this pandemic and look forward to a, a post-pandemic global economy? What are you most optimistic about? Well, I'm most optimistic that this crisis will, will force uh, a return to and a re-embracing of real global cooperation because there will have to be a recognition that we are all in this together. On COVID response, that means you know really stepping up and vaccinating everybody while also stepping up and investing in genetic surveillance because it matters now in the United States what type of variant is spreading quickly in South Africa and what the nature of that variant does. I, you know, I'm optimistic about global cooperation on economics because I think the IMF and the World Bank, the Brenton Woods institutions partnering with the Chinese and others can reinvigorate financing and monetary and fiscal support for emerging markets and emerging nations you know, that simply will need it in order to avoid this great divergence. So I think there is, a, is an increasing recognition we're all in this together and a, and a new willingness, uh, certainly in the United States, and perhaps that will become infectious to sit at the table together and hammer out solutions so we can march forward in a more just and a more equitable manner. Yeah, perhaps in no other way have we been all in this together. Dambisa, your thoughts on, on what you're most positive on post this pandemic? I am positive on three things. Um, number one, China. Um, I, you know, I think we've got to keep them around the table. They were the largest economy in the world in the 1700s. They are vying to do that again, um, not just on an absolute GDP basis, but on a per capita income basis. They are the largest foreign direct investor and trading partner and, and uh, uh, um, sort of cooperative partner with many countries around the world. Um, I think it could be transformative in our lifetimes. Second point, technology. Um, I think we've seen technology do phenomenal things. And I think um, John is right. Um, if you think about the FANGs, they, they've been done phenomenal things, mainly on the side of social networking and consumerism. I think we are yet to see what they're going to do in public goods, such as education and healthcare. Um, and I, I'm very excited about that. And I think that in, in some silver lining um, uh, argument, I think COVID has shown, whether it's telemarketing or just the speed with which you've been able to deliver the vaccines, um, we can actually uh, see how technology is, is transforming the world. The final point, green. Um, I think it is. this is a real opportunity to go back to the drawing board. I happen to be on the board of Chevron. I know Chevron is right in there, like many other energy companies, keenly interested in seeing how green energy is going to be transforming and transformative on, in terms of jobs, but also in terms of our economy more generally. So those are my three for now. All right. And John, I'll give you the last word. Leave us with some inspiring thoughts here when we think about what our global economy is going to look like when we come out the other side of this. I'd say two things. I think the first one I would follow up on, on, on Dambisa's point that I do think technology is transforming the world so rapidly. Uh, this digital revolution is a big deal and it's improving the quality of life for most everyone here in America. And I know there are pockets of poverty and pockets of unfairness that are not benefiting from these changes. And I know we're fighting to improve that. So I think number one point is again, this technology revolution is gonna make life better for, for most folks around the world. The second point, though, is the one that gets back to what we've been talking about. The, this this uh, wealth divide in our country has just gotten dramatically worse. I'm optimistic that because in this environment of the George Floyd murder, what's happened in the healthcare, when people are seeing the unfairness that minority communities are facing, I'm finding CEOs and political leaders are more inspired than ever in fighting hard to open up uh, doors to in, improve minority business, uh, minority employment and understanding that if we can bring all of our economy together and bring all of our citizens of all colors engaged in our economy fully, we'll be able to grow faster, we'll be a more dynamic society when we include everyone. And I think that makes me quite optimistic. 
for sure, hoping for a healthier and more equitable world uh, post the pandemic. My thanks today for our wonderful panelists for their insights, Dambisa Moyo, John Rogers, and Dr. Rajiv Shah. Thank you all for being with us for this edition of Davos Agenda, a co-partnership between Yahoo Finance and the World Economic Forum. Thanks again, and we will see you next time.